Okay. So good evening, everyone from India. I'm Dr. Gaganleep Kaur. We, I highly welcome you all to Global Interdisciplinary Summit 2020, co-hosted by Global Outreach Medical and Health Association. So moving on to the next session of the day after Dr. We had a great session by Dr. Omid, and now we're moving on to Dr. Ziv for the next session of the day. So before moving on to that, I would like to guide every participant that uh, the registration forms for each session are there given in the description box. So kindly fill them with a screenshot of the session, which will be acting as a proof. So stay tuned for the session by Dr. Ziv. And speaking about him, I would like to tell that Dr. Ziv is one of the Israel's leading periodontists. He graduated from the periodontal department at Hadassah School of Dental Medicine in Jerusalem, where he served as a clinical instructor and lecturer for undergraduates and postgraduate dental students. Since 1993, doctor has been engaged in clinical research in the field of bone augmentation and sinus flow elevation. He's currently participating in the quest for improving and elevating new grafting materials using various growth factors, as well as researching osseodensification, a paradigm shift in the dental implantology. Professor is a renowned author in dental implantology and is known worldwide for his innovative approaches and cutting edge procedures and technologies. He's a world known speaker and has lectures extensively, both nationally and internationally. He's part of the continuing education faculty at the New York University and an associate professor at T2 University in Romania. He conducts and moderates advanced international implantology courses and workshops. He's the past president of Israel Periodontal Surgery. So with this, I would like to invite Dr. Ziv with us for the session. And so the stage is all yours. So thank you very much for the introduction. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to share a little bit of my knowledge together this evening with you. And again, I want to say hello to all my global friends, wherever you are. Some of them are watching right now. I know that there was a time change, so maybe not all of them could participate. But we are going to have a little bit of fun in the next hour. And the topic that I chose to speak on is thinking outside the box in dental implantology from planning to execution. And we will show you today what we have done in the past and how it differs to what we are doing in the present, present and probably in the future. Now, I'm not a magician, even though some of the cases that you are about to see would maybe look to you like magic, but there is no magic. It all starts and ends in the right treatment planning. So we have to stop before the patient comes, think what we want to achieve, and create what we decided to do for him as a treatment plan. So I picked up four cases that would give you an overview on how we think and how we execute our treatment plan. And I will start with the maxillary anterior vertical bone deficiency dilemma. So here is a patient. She comes in with an old bridge with a failing upper central. No bone, probably the bone is up there where, where I did the mark here. She has pain, there is a periapical lesion, and not only that, we also are dealing with a narrow ridge. So we have both a pathology in the tooth, right there, that needs, of course, to be extracted. So when we look at the situation, we have different options. And I'm talking here about the case that I've done probably more than 10 years ago. What are the treatment options? Treatment options are first extract, do some socket preservation, 
and then do a conventional fixed bridge. Remember, not every time we have to rush and go for impacts. The other option, of course, is extract, do preservation, and then do implants placement. Now, if we do decide to place implants, we would need to do all kinds of vertical and horizontal bone augmentations. And there are different types of treatment modalities that we can utilize. We can do socket preservation and augmentation. We can do GBR with particulated bone and membranes. We can use or utilize bone blocks for GBR. We can do rib split for the deficient uh, horizontal dimension. And we can even think about destruction osteogenesis. So I decided first to extract, do some socket preservation, give the patient a temporary uh, acrylic bridge, and do the socket preservation. So we did socket preservation, placed some collagen on top, closed it up, and waited a little bit for healing for a few weeks. So after a few weeks on the right-hand side, you see that the gingiva looks better. Is there more bone here? Probably not, because we didn't do any GBR procedure here. So we are still having the huge defect both in the bone and also in the soft tissues. So if you pick up the way you want to treat that case, there are different options. I always aim to go and find the option that would give me, of course, what I want to achieve in the fastest way without causing the patient a lot of morbidity. So, you need a team, of course, and in this uh, situation, uh, we were working as a team, and we decided to do an outside-the-box procedure. So I'm not going to do any major flap reflections here with the gingiva around the teeth, because I want to take and bring the bony segment down together with the soft tissues. This is what we call the sandwich technique that was first described by Oli Jensen from the US. And basically, we want to bring the entire segment downward, both the bone and the soft tissues. And we will fixate the two segments with a plate, place our biomaterial, and everything will be covered with PRF. We close the tissues, we take a post-op CBCP and we see nicely a wedge of bone that was placed in between the two bony segments. So right at the end of the surgery, I had to cut off, of course, the acrylic portion of the bridge, the pink one, because we brought down the hard and soft tissues. So that's how it looks like a few weeks later. Looks, of course, much better, but since I am a little bit, uh, I would say, not just a periodontist, but a perfectionist, I decided to do another step. So here is the case, five months later, and the gingiva, of course, looks much, much better. I opened up, I took out the plate, took the fixating screws, took out the plate, and now I'm able to place my implants. And since I want a very thick buccal wall, and we know from the literature that we need at least three millimeters of thickness, I decided to use narrow diameter implants here. So we place the implants, and we cover again with PRF and some additional graft material. And here you can see how much we love PRF in our augmentation procedures. So here it is, completely covered with PRF membranes and primary closure. Now we have a healing that, of course, would enable each one of you to do a decent prosthetics. So the prosthetics had been delivered 
And here you can see the post-op radiograph of the ridge with the implants, with the prosthetics, and that's a 12-year follow-up of that particular case. So that was for the anterior maxillary deficiency dilemma. Now let's take another area which is very difficult to treat, and that's the posterior mandibular height dilemma. So here is a 65-year-old female that made up her mind to get rid of her dentures. And that's how she was presented in 2010, 10 years ago. She had implants before, and all those implants failed, except for one that you can see on the left-hand side. That's how she came to me. And when I looked at the x-rays, I found out that there is some horizontal deficiency in the anterior maxillary area, and there is some deficiency in height in the posterior regions. So we decided to move ahead and place as many implants as we can, together with the closed sinus augmentations in the back, with some bone expansion in the anterior segment. I created a, and designed a guide, 3D guide, that would give me the position of where my future implants should be. We opened up the ridge, seated the guide, and did our pilot drill osteotomies. In the distal parts, we did minimal invasive sinus surgery by applying a balloon device. And here is the graft which is injected, that is the nova bone, putty. Implants are placed, and in the anterior part, I was using the manual expanders. Nowadays, I would not touch those instruments because we have the osseodensifying drills. So at that time, we utilized those expanders, and in the back, we placed only PRF as our graft material. And there is a lot of literature and data to back this type of treatment modality. The ridges are completely covered with PRF membranes to also augment the keratinized gingiva, as you will see later on. So that was stage one. But the big issue that I want to share with you today is the mandibular area. And what I marked here in red is the position of the mental foramen, right on top of the ridge. So what should be our treatment plan? And the lady wants a fixed restoration. So we decided here to bypass the mandibular nerve. Again, thinking outside the box. The implants will be positioned laterally to the mandibular nerve. Now, don't even think about doing it without having a very good guide. So we fabricated a 3D guide and the implant would stay on the buccal aspect and the mandibular nerve stays lingual to our implants. And of course, we have to take safety uh, of at least one and a half millimeters. So here is the guide that we designed. Here is the ridge. You can see that's a completely resolved ridge. We are sitting the guide. The openings that you see here in the guide are just um, uh, fabricated, so we will not create pressure on the mental nerve, which is right over there. The anterior part, not a huge problem. We can place implants like you see here. And in the posterior segment, we are placing the implants laterally to the nerve. And you can actually see very nicely the position of the implant and where the nerve is, right on the side. So here again, you see the positioning of the implants and I marked the mental foramen, how it comes out of the ridge right at the crest. Again, PRF is our big, huge friend. We are covering everything with PRF membranes, closing it up. And here is the post-op uh, radiographic appearance. 
Now, when taking a post-op CBCT, you can easily identify and see the trajectory of the nerve and exactly where the implants are as opposed to where the nerve is. And you can actually see that there is no uh, intimacy between the nerve and the implants. So we can move now forward. Here is the upper jaw. Notice how much carotenized gingiva we gained by using PRF. And we can fabricate now a temporary for the upper, change the profile of the patient, take impressions for the lower jaw, and fabricate a screw retained prosthesis to the lower jaw. And here you can see a post op CBCT with the prosthetics and again the trajectory of the nerve. And that is a 10 year post op of that case. Third case of thinking outside the box, the immediate fixed temporization dilemma. So 12 years ago, patients come, patient comes in, 55 year female with a dental phobia. She had never been to a dentist except once to get an upper denture. So here is the clinical view of her lower dentition. And here is her denture. And you can actually see very nicely here how the, uh, on the x-ray looks to you like you have sufficient bone. Well, not exactly, because when you look at the uh, x-rays, you can see that that's a very, very deficient ridge. Actually, you can see that there is almost no bone here. So what are we to do in this situation? That's what we are dealing with. So that's a complete nightmare. One second, please. Hello? Hello? The slides are not changing? Well, in my computer, I see them clearly, so maybe, okay, so I, I will stop share and do it again. And let me know if you see. Okay. Sorry for that. I will do another time sharing of my screen. And I hope you will see it now better. So please let me know if you see it better. So actually now we see the upper maxilla, the upper anterior maxilla, and the amount of bone that we are dealing with. I hope you are able to see it now uh, much better. So actually, what are we going to do in this situation? And just to remind you, the lady wants a fixed restoration. So anyone here thinks that he can place an implant in that deficient ridge? Well, I must tell you that even myself, I cannot dream on placing an implant at this situation. So what I decided to do, and that is the lower jaw. So we are not talking about a favorable case even here. So what is the treatment option that we can give that patient? And remember, she comes to my office because she wants a fixed restoration, both in the upper and in the lower jaw. So we started with the lower jaw. That is my treatment plan. 
I would like to place those implants, providing, of course, we have sufficient bone, and we know that we don't have sufficient bone, especially in the anterior part and also in the posterior. And by projecting the case on a 3D software, we can actually see exactly where we are. So we can extract the teeth and we will cut off a little portion of the bone here to get to a good platform where we would be able to place our implants. And I already know from the planning that on the lower distal part here, I would need to do horizontal augmentation. That's why I placed those two tenting screws here in order to uh, support my membrane and bone. So that is where I'm going to cut the bone. And in order to cut it very uh, efficiently uh, and accurately, we designed a reduction guide that sits on the bone and tells me exactly how much bone I need to cut. If that would not be accurate, I would not be able to place my surgical guide and drill to place my implants. So let's take a look. Clearance of the anterior teeth, sitting the reduction guide. Now we will take our piezo device and we will cut the bone off from buccal to uh, lingual. So here is the ridge, exactly identical to how the uh, 3D model uh, looks like. So we sit the surgical guide, and now we are able to start and drill for the implants. And here you can see the accuracy of our surgical guide right in the middle of the ridge. Remember the buccal aspect where I said that I would need to place those uh, tenting screws to hold my membrane and bone graft? That's exactly what we have done. And I decided to immediately load the six anterior implants with a prefabricated temporary bridge, as you can see right here. And the patient leaves the office after the first surgery with all the planned implants together with the temporary fixed restoration that we delivered. Well, four months later, we took another CBCT and I immediately I see that in order to expose those implants, probably I would have to remove some bone because there is an overgrowth of bone on top of the cover screws. So now let's get to the fun part, the upper jaw. Looks to you as you have sufficient width and tissues to place implants. Well, my friends, never judge by appearance. Because remember what we have here, very deficient knife edge ridge. Now, of course, my maxillofacial friends probably would go and do blocks. My perio friends probably would go and do GPR with particulate. But that is not really the issue because every one of us, which is skilled and experienced, he knows how to do GPR. And there are many ways to get to, let's say, to Mumbai. You can take a plane, you can take a train, but it depends what is the safest way that will bring you to your destination. And the treatment plan here was a little bit difficult. Why was it difficult? First, there is no doubt we need to do sinus augmentations. There is no doubt we need to do horizontal ridge augmentation. The most difficult part here is temporization. Because no matter what you do, if you bring back the patient her own existing denture, you kiss your graft bye-bye. So I banged my, hand, my head for a couple of nights before I came to an outside-the-box solution. 
And that was my solution. I'm going to place mini implants in the palatal bone and use the palatal bone like a piece of wood just to anchor those implants that will secure a fixed temporization. And while doing so, I can do all the GBR procedures that you wish. You can do the sinuses, you can do the horizontal ridge and so on. So that was my plan to place those mini implants, which are 1.8 millimeter in diameter and give you the opportunity to do a screw retained temporary restoration. And here is the planning. And on the plan, you can also see the nature of the bone we are dealing with. Because if you take a look at the distal parts where the implants are, you can see that the density of the bone is almost like soft tissue and air. Only small parts here that are stained in green are cortical bone. Actually, I can tell you that those implants, I could deliver them by my fingers. Here is the other part, exactly the same. So in order to place the implants in the right position in the palatal bone, I created a surgical guide. I lifted up, raised the flap, seated the guide, and marked the position of where my implants should be. So here you can start to see where I positioned those mini implants, right in the palatal aspect. Then later on, you can graft your sinuses. You can place your tenting screws in the anterior buccal area. And here you see nicely in this picture, the four tenting screws, the prosthetic components of the mini implants. And now the graft material, which consisted at that time of 50% xenograft and 50% allograft mixed with PRL. Primary closure, that is a must in all regenerative procedures. And here you can see immediately post-op the temporization and the implants that were placed. Now we waited for about six months and prayed, of course. And after six months, you can see the picture. We have nice bone formation almost wherever you look at. So here are the mini implants. Here is the ridge, which looks now completely different from what we started with. Look how much bone is present on the buccal aspect and where the mini implant is. And here is the bone that was created, and those are the tenting screws right there. So we can go ahead now and we can take out the mini implants and look how the soft tissues react to those mini implants. No inflammation, nothing. Now we designed a surgical guide and a second temporary that will sit on the new implants that I'm going to insert right now. So from one millimeter ridge, we have here almost 14. And that is solid rock. One of my friends, Bill Becker in the US once said that if it looks like bone, hard like bone and tastes like bone, probably it's bone. So we can now uh, do our drilling and place six anterior implants and immediately load them with a temporary. So now that is the new picture. We have 10 implants in the upper jaw and nine implants in the lower jaw. And we are very close to fulfilling our patient's expectations. And remember, she came for a fixed restoration, upper and lower. And when she got the restoration, she was the happiest woman I ever met. And I can tell you that she's now one of my best patients regarding oral hygiene. And she maintains it like crazy. And that's a 10-year post-op of her case. 
So that's how we started and that's where we finished. So we go now in time and we arrive to 2014. And 2014 was a turning point in my professional career. And that is all because of that gentleman uh, named Salah Weiss, who discovered and introduced the osteodensification concept. And I just picked up two cases that have been done quite recently, I mean, in the last six years, to show you the difference between what we are doing today to what we have done previously, like I showed you before. So that is a patient that comes and needs fixed restoration, and he doesn't want me to touch his sinuses. Why? Because a patient, a, a neighbor of his had some infections, and he doesn't really wants to get into sinus uh, treatments. So I look, a very deficient ridge, and I said, well, you know what? Let's give it a try. I designed a surgical guide and I decided to place five to six implants, narrow diameter implants, between one sinus to the other. Now, if you look carefully, you see that we have a triangular bone with a I would say a trabecular bone inside between the two corticals. And that was my plan to place those five or six implants. And it was quite challenging. Why? Because first of all, the opposing arch had a zirconial fixed bridge. So we really need to place implants which will be long enough and stable to hold those mastication forces. And when I opened up the reach, you can realize that that was a very narrow, minimal reach. So what are we going to do? I marked the place where I want to place my implants, and then I started with the magic. And the magic is also densification. And you can see how the reach opens up here on the palatal aspect and also here on the buccal aspect. And now it enables me to place, that's a 3.75 diameter implant in that deficient ridge. So implants are inserted, high stability. We do a PRF block with our biomaterial and that will be a veneer graft that will be placed on the buccal aspect. And everything will be covered with LPRF membranes. Primary closure, same day patient gets his screw retained restoration. And here you can see the screw retained restoration that he got uh, 24 hours after the surgery. And I even asked my dental technician to take out the six anterior teeth from his old denture and put them in the new restoration. And that's why nobody could have recognized any change in his profile and appearance. That's how he looked like right after the surgery. That is with the temporization. And that is a six-year six -year post-op of his case. And the last case I want to show you is also a recent one, a typical one to what I usually get in my office because in my office, unfortunately, I don't get the easy cases, only the ones nobody wants to treat or the failures. So here is a lady in her uh, late seventies with a failing dentition. You can see the pus coming out from different uh, places. And that is all because she is lacking bone due to advanced periodontal disease. Almost no bone in the posterior, minimal amount of bone in the anterior, also horizontal deficiency. 
and that is the upper left. So what is the treatment plan? Well, I told you today we try to do it as simple as we can and as quick as we can. So we designed a treatment plan that will consist of implants placed in the anterior part with osseodensification and sinus lift with osseodensification in the back. That is the plan. Now let's see the execution. So I extracted the, the upper teeth. We prepare our osteotomies with our denser burrs. I hardly use any other burrs in my office. And now we can insert the implants with high torque and high stability. I go to the back and we do the sinus with osseodensification. We take PRF, we do PRF blocks, and we will now build up the buccal aspect with our PRF blocks covered with PRF membranes. Now we can take impressions, send it to the lab and get the same day a fixed temporary screw retained restoration. And later on, four months later, it will be changed with the final screw retained restoration. Now we go to the bottom. That is the upper with the final. Now we go to the bottom. And that was my plan in the bottom. Place four long implants in the front and two short implants on both sides in the back. So that is the plan. Let's see the execution. You can even see here still the pus coming out from those failing anterior teeth. We are utilizing the teeth as our graft material. To my opinion, this is one of the best choices that you can think of because that is autologous from the same patient, contains all the growth factors, and that is a slow resolving material, which is a big advantage. There is a protocol, of course, how to process it, how to sterilize it, and use it as a graft material. And again, the preparations are done with my denser burrs. And in the back, we are placing those implants, which are quite unique. They are short implants that are, have a device that opens them up uh, while seated. So it's like a nail that you put in the wall and it opens up, same here. So this is the implant here and it opens up. Uh, and by that uh, virtue, you get also higher stability and actually you increase the implant's surface area by opening it up. So a short implant is equivalent to a much longer one. So here are the implants in the front that were seated and now we are placing the dentin graft material all around to build up the ridge. We take impressions, send it to the lab and get same day screw retained temporization. So here it is with both upper and lower and actually you can see nicely here the short implants that simply open up. And that's how she looks like. And she's very happy. So I want to welcome all of you, not just my friends in India, but wherever you are, to come to our new teaching center in Tel Aviv, Israel. Israel and Tel Aviv is one of the most beautiful place, places, believe me. I know I'm not objective, but that is the truth. Uh, that is the new facility that we build up as part of the Versa Osseodensification Academy. We have a big faculty and with some of the most renowned international speakers like Nelson Pinto, 
הווי גלקמן, סמוול בליין, ג'ורג' קוצקיס, יאניס ורגוליס, פטריק פלאצ'י, and we run different type of courses throughout the year. You are most welcome to join us, and I would really like to have all of you uh, and give you the best hospitality that you can think of here in Tel Aviv, Israel. So I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, sir, for the wonderful oration and wonderful lecture you've taken. And, um, okay, we'll uh, move on to the questions. So one, uh, so one question I, I uh, like we have. Uh, this is, what was out of the box? What was out of the box? Yes, sir. Well, if you think about all the procedures that I was showing, like bypassing the nerve by 3D planning, that is a complete outside the box thinking. Bringing in the first case, the bony segment down without dealing with the soft tissues around the teeth, that is a complete outside the box uh, treatment uh, option. I mean, every case shows you different treatment modalities. Using osteodensification instead of using GBR procedures, that's also an outside the box procedure. So if I don't know the meaning of outside the box, maybe <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. So uh, next question is from Dr. Vivek. Which short implants do you use? Please elaborate. Okay. The short implants that I was showing here are called Pyramidion implants. They are manufactured by an Israeli company and they have a pattern and a unique design of the opening of those wings, uh, of those uh, uh, short implants, and they come in the length of from five to eight millimeters. Okay. Mm, okay, and we have the next part of the question that uh, why, do you, why you don't prefer to put tilted implants in lower or upper arch in your last case? Well, in my last case, I did place tilted implants in the upper jaw on one side. In the mandibular side, I prefer to have a long span of implants that would carry the load. And it's much better than to place implants just in the anterior part because that will reduce the cantilever effect of the prosthesis. Okay. Mm, yes. So next question we have from Dr. Suraj. So in which manner you used tooth mixture here with PRF? With which manner I used the tooth mixture? Yes, sir, that uh, basically the, the grinded, grounded, gr grinded. yes, sir. Okay, so I'm using here the device of uh, Cometa Bio, which is a tooth grinder. This is based on studies that were done by Professor Binderman that published as on that specific uh, treatment in 2014. Basically, you can utilize patients' own teeth, but only patients own teeth. You cannot take one tooth from one patient and deliver it to another patient. Uh, Definitely. Actually, you can even use teeth that were exfoliated, and that means you can use them years after. And as a matter of fact, I have a lot of patients that are coming to my office with, her, with their teeth that exfoliated or wisdom teeth 
or even deciduous teeth that can be utilized because they contain all the growth factors. Okay, definitely. Uh, next, next question is from, okay, the association itself. The bone substitute of your choice by Dr. Sandeep. We have the question, the, uh, which of the bone substitute you prefer or what's your choice for that? Well, I would say whenever I can use no substitute, that would be the best because blood clot and PRF is by far more superior than any biomaterial. But in some instances where we have big defects, uh, we of course utilize uh, biomaterials and I prefer biomaterials which have the possibility of being remodeled and resolved to have newborn formation. This is why I don't like anorganic bovine mineral. That is definitely not my preference of choice. I would use it only in cases where I want to do a veneer graft because I want the material to stay there for a long period of time. In sinuses, of course, you can use whatever you want because any biomaterial will work in the sinus. That we know for a long time. But for sockets and ridges, I would prefer to use a material that would turn into new bone. And generally speaking, if you look for what is the best material, ask yourself, what would you do to yourself or to your mother? Definitely, sir. <laughs> that would, you know, give all the answers to them on their own, actually. Okay, next question we have from Dr. Vikram. Uh, the doubt was that zygomatic implants are not worthy instead of grafting? Well, zygomatic implants is uh, an alternative in very severe atrophic cases. But to my opinion, zygomatic implants should be our last resort. So if you don't have any ability to do conventional procedures, then you should turn into zygomatic. Because when a zygomatic implant fails or gets complicated, that's a big pain in the neck. Okay. So next we have uh, Dr. Chapin. When do you use the dentine graft? Did you do it with, the, with or without collagen membrane? Okay, well, when do I use a dentin graft? Well, just yesterday I gave a webinar on utilizing dentin as a graft material. I would use it wherever I need to do bone augmentation. So that can be socket preservation, filling gaps around implants, lateral and vertical bone augmentation, sinus augmentations, you name it, whatever you need. As for membranes, if you have a contained defect, actually, I don't use any membrane. I only use PRF on top. Definitely. Okay. Uh, next question we have. Okay. Next question we have from Dr. Jacob. The short implants you used in the last case, will it not cause resorption due to extreme compression of the bone? Well, actually not. Why? Because when we use those short implants, they go inside very passively without any, I mean, the, the insertion torque is not exceeding 30 or 35 newtons. And when we start to open them up, we do it very, very slowly and gradually. So there is almost no pressure on the bone and therefore there will be no bone resorption. Okay. Next we have from Dr. Rutza. Why do you prefer using PRF membranes over collagen membranes? Why do I prefer PRF membranes instead of collagen membranes? Collagen, yes sir. Well, because first of all, we like natural products. I'm a big fan of green dentistry. 
Now, the PRF has superior qualities because it contains a lot of growth factors. It promotes angiogenesis. It is antibacterial. So you can even leave it exposed in some uh, situations. Now, membranes are mechanical barriers. They are slowing down the healing. So why should I use a membrane if I can speed up the healing by utilizing PRF? Definitely. Definitely. Okay, next we have um, Dr. Vikram. Sir, will, uh, uh, he would like to know your views regarding graftless implant procedure. Graftless implant procedures? Yes, sir. Well, de depends in what situations. I mean, in sinuses, uh, we've already talked about it, that we can utilize no graft when placing our implants. Yeah. When we have defects, around our implants, we, can we cannot leave the defects as they are without grafting them. Otherwise, we will get soft tissue invagination, and then we will have defects around our implants. So I really don't understand the meaning of graftless uh, implant placement. If you don't have a defect, then you don't need a graft. Okay. And for jumping distance? Jumping distance, well, my rule of thumb is that whenever I have less than two millimeters, there is no need to, uh, to graft the, the void around the implant. But when I do my implant, since I always take PRF, I don't really care how much distance I have. I always pack the gap with PRF. So you're dependent on primary stability, right? Right. We will always get primary stability if we use osseodensification. Oh, definitely. Definitely so. So we have an interesting question now uh, from Dr. Vivek. So you said that you can use the tooth of the person as graft later also. So what is the maximum time, months or years, when can use the extracted teeth as graft of the person? And how to preserve those teeth for using for later on? Okay, that's a very good question, and I have a very good answer. Now, there was a study done in 2005 by a German anatomist named Schultz, and he found that the growth factors are preserved in the tooth for centuries. Okay. okay. That means you can utilize a tooth throughout the lifespan of an individual, meaning that if you have a deciduous tooth of a patient, let's say at the age of 10, and you want to use it at the age of 80, there is no problem. Okay. Now, you can store the teeth if they are not processed or not grinded. You simply store the tooth in a small container, and that's it. And then you will grind it at the time of the surgery. But if you want to store a grinded tooth, then you have first to uh, dry it up, put it like in a war coffee warmer, like 50 degrees or so, so it will be dry. Then put it in a deppen dish, close it, and put it in the refrigerator. When you want to use it, then you start to do the same protocol as a normal tooth. You don't need to, to grind it, but you have to sterilize it again and go all over the steps. So can we uh, store the, you know, grinded tooth mixed with PRF or blood? Can we store that? Well, I'm mixing a lot of the dentin with PRF. That is my best choice for graft. I mean, uh, like, can that mixture be pre uh, like preserved for a longer time? No, the PRF would not last for a long time. It stays okay. there like a couple of weeks. And once okay. you dry the material, of course, you will have no remnants of the PRF. But okay. once you use it again, then take blood from the patient and do new PRF. Definitely, definitely. 
Okay, next question we have from Dr. Nishan. Is tenting of sinus necessary to maintain the lift? And can implant be placed with placing grafts after lifting the membrane? Can you repeat the question? Yes, sir. Uh, is tenting of sinus necessary to maintain the lift? And can implant be placed with placing implant uh, when uh, with placing graft after lifting the membrane? So, ten, well, regarding tenting, when we do osseodensification and and I would say that 95% of my sinuses today are done only with osseodensification. Okay. So by using osseodensification, we tent up the Schneiderian membrane with our burrs, but actually it's not the burr, it's the residual bone which is pushed up against the membrane. Okay. And then that is tenting the membrane up, and then we place our implants without any problem. Now, what was the second part of the question? Um, so, okay. Um, I think uh, we are not catch, we're not having catch on hold of the question. Okay, yeah. Uh, can implant be placed with placing graft after lifting the membrane? After after lifting the membrane, we place the graft, yes, and then we can place the implant, of course. Implant. Okay. Sure. Okay. That was quite tricky, actually. <laughs> okay. Next question we have from Dr. Jacob again. What is your opinion on, uh, on not using any graft material in indirect sinus lifts? Well... If uh, he watched my presentation, probably he has seen a case where I did a closed sinus augmentation utilizing PRF only. So I'm a big believer in using PRF as a graph material. Definitely, sir. So uh, next we have from, from Dr. Shi. What is the brand of expandable short implants? Oh, the, it is called Pyramidion. Okay. Um, next is from Dr. Parsa. What is the difference between uh, Zararov implants and the Israel brand you used? The difference between what was the first brand? Uh, La Lazarov. Lazarov implants and the Israel brand you used. Well, I don't really know what are Lazarov implants, so I don't know okay. how to react. But well, you know, almost all implants, I can tell you a secret. Yes. All the implants are manufactured from the same metal, from titanium. <laughs> Definitely. The differences, the differences are very minor regarding the topography of the implant surface. The design, yeah. And the huge difference between implants is not the manufacturer, but this is the hand of the operator. Definitely, definitely. Any of the implants can, you know, also then, uh, like integrate with the bone when the proper procedure is followed. Okay, so next we have from the Dr. Jaco. He has heard some lecture where, uh, where he said osteodensification does not work. What is your opinion on the same? I think he has heard yeah. some lecture where it was mentioned that osteodensification doesn't work. Well, the only, I would imagine that the only reason why someone would say that osseodensification doesn't work is that he didn't even practice osseodensification. So that's, that statement is really not relevant. Okay. You cannot argue with the literature, you cannot argue with all the bunch of clinicians worldwide, which are big believers in it. Definitely, sir. Okay, so next we have from Dr. Utsar. Sir, in context of using PRF membrane, it would resolve faster than collagen membrane. 
so wouldn't the stability to be compromised since you normally do immediate temporization that's a very good question and i have also have a very good answer now if you noticed i use prf membranes all the time but take a look at what kind of graft material is underneath because if I use, for instance, the dentin as a graft material, this is a very slow resolving material. And this is why even when the membrane goes away and being resolved, still the material maintains the volume, the width, and the height. And there was a beautiful study done by Shnuzana Paul that came out recently showing the uh, preservation of the ridge dimensions using the denting graft. Okay. Hmm. So I think the lecture has been quite informative and quite interesting for all the participants since we are having a lot and lot of questions more to answer. But I think due to lack of time, we are, uh, you know, but we have to go I, ahead with it. The, answer, the question that I like the most is what is outside the box? <laughs> definitely, definitely, sir, definitely. <laughs> you know, uh, having all these questions uh, uh, increases the interest also. So I think we'll uh, move on to the cessation of the session with this. So thank you so much, sir, for the session you took and the knowledge and also you know clarifying all the doubts of the uh, the participants who are actually watching you right now so with thank this, you and i want to wish all of you to stay safe yes. and get over quickly of that coronavirus so you too definitely thank you so much so and with this i would like to um, Tell all the participants to reach to www.gomha.org regarding details for participation certificates, CE certificates, as well as the speaker's schedule. We're all lined up with amazing speakers like him. So kindly stay tuned. Thank you.